inspire, connect, resource, growing healthy churches, is in relationship for God's mission. Can I, um, can I welcome you warmly to our conversation today? We're delighted that Rachel is here and going to be serving us, and there'll be more about that in a moment, but wel- wel- welcome particularly, Rachel, to you. Um, in this opening moment or two of coming intentionally before God, um, I was thinking about all the talk about bubbles uh, that's been going on. And uh, I don't know whether you've just about sort of exhausted of thinking about your work bubble uh, or your social bubble. Wave your hand if you're in a bubble of some sort at this moment or time. A household bubble. Uh, anyone in a work bubble? Uh, anyone in an education bubble? Uh, normally because you're involved in education in some way so there's all sorts of bubbles and uh, you know we'll look forward to not having to keep on using the word unless you're a West Ham supporter and um, uh, if you're a West Ham supporter you ought to be singing quite quickly about about bubbles because you're not doing very well so um, household bubble is the main thing and household uh, has become a word for divvying people up away from each other, hasn't it? Which is not the best way to use it, of um, not being able to have contact with other people who are in a different household. There is a healthier way and uh, a bigger vision way in which the word household is used in the New Testament. And it's the way in which the Apostle Paul says that we are all invited into the household of God. Those that were previously divided up into different sections, Jews and Gentiles he's thinking of particularly, are now made one in Christ, Christ who's wanting to unite all things and fill all things and bring near those who are far off. So the wonderful thing about our virtual household today that we're in right now, this is a legal bubble, by the way, that we're in at the moment, is that all right, of 90 odd people. But in this virtual household, we're just a tiny taste of God's great big vision for his planet and of all humankind. And we're conscious today, as Rachel serves us, of the people that are not here in this household, uh, as well as those that are. And um, just recently, I was watching a little bit of a video from Tom Wright, who keeps on producing loads of stuff. And in it, uh, I made a link to a, a sort of probably not very fashionable folksy American hymn called All Are Welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Wave a hand if you've ever sung that before. Okay, so a limited reach. But um, because I'm not going to sing it, and we're not going to sing it, uh, but because I think the lyrics capture what it means to actually be in this house that God's got a vision for, I wanted to read the lyrics, lead in a short sentence of prayer, and that would be it. But here are the lyrics. Uh, This is an American uh, composer called Marty Horgan, who's written it. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong and true, where all God's children dare to seek, to dream God's reign anew. Here the cross shall stand as witness and a symbol of God's grace. Here as one we claim the faith of Jesus. All are welcome. All are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let's pray. Dear God, for the great welcome that we discover in Christ, who is seeking to gather all people together from all places and across all divides, thank you. For these moments of knowing that we are welcomed by you and joined together by the Spirit, thank you. For Rachel among us to serve and to lead and to provoke and to challenge and to encourage, thank you. And would you be with her and all of us, 
helping us to grasp and to learn and to know and to follow through on what you have for us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to see you. We've, we've really been looking forward to this day, and we're really grateful to Rachel, who's given up time to be with us. Uh, I, I think this is one of the most important issues that we need to talk about as church in this day. Uh, for many of us, one of the elephants in the room is what we're we doing in terms of developing, reaching out, uh, equipping, enabling uh, young generation, young leaders, young disciples to emerge amongst our churches. And I think it's a challenge, not just uh, for smaller churches, it's a challenge for every church across our, our, the United Kingdom at this time. So we're really grateful to have Rachel to be part of uh, this session uh, and to share with us. Uh, I've realised that Rachel and I, um, we've got a few connections. So we both, uh, we both grew up in Sussex, um, uh, Rachel also went to London School of Theology. I went to London Bible College in the days when it was called London Bible College. Uh, and we both started our ministry uh, in youth work, in youth ministry, schools work and so forth. Uh, Rachel has continued in that vein. She's, she's a youth worker at heart and says she will always be so until the end, end of um, her calling yeah, under God. Yeah, on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whereas, whereas my journey has been slightly different from that point point on but Rachel we're really really pleased to have you you're you're you're, you're a youth worker at heart you still do youth work you got you became fairly well known through no sex please we're teenagers that the BBC did a documentary on which you were part of uh, you founded the Romance Academy yeah. um, you're now director of Youthscape president of GB uh, an author and a campaigner in your spare time not that you have much spare time and you're also a mother to two children and a wife so um I, it's, a, it's an exhausting life but we're so grateful that you've given us some of your precious time to join with us so rachel let me just quickly pray for you and then you lead us lord we thank you for rachel and we ask for your blessing to be upon her now and we pray that the spirit of god would speak through us in this key issue about young people particularly uh, and may we hear your voice and be equipped by you to act well for the glory of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. Thank you. In a minute, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get all technical, but I just want to look you all beautiful people in the eye um, because I'm so sad that I can't be meeting you physically. I was so looking forward to coming, to being released from the north, coming back to the south, which is my comfort zone. And um, I've been so excited to meet you all. Um, but Zoom is good, isn't it? And um, thank you, Joss, for so kindly saying that I'm giving up some of my precious time. Do you know what? I'm, I'm really conscious that you're giving up your precious time too, um, and that you're leading a church in, in a time where, you know, there's no books written on how you lead churches through pandemics. Like, I mean, it's been throughout history, God's people have risen up in extraordinary times, but I'm so mindful of, of what you're facing. Um, and so my heart, although I absolutely want to provoke and challenge and inspire around this topic, I really want to encourage you and, and for my words to bless you immensely because God is so delighted with you. <laughs> you are his son, you are his daughter, and I really want today to bless your heart and to provoke you to action. Um, but I, I know that I've got in front of me people who love young people, who love your communities. So I'm totally seeing us all, you know, we're in this together and I really hope that my words encourage you. I've, I'm using a keynote presentation, which I tend to wrap, I tend to go through things quite quickly. I don't have lots of text on the screens. So it might feel like you get to the end of the session and think, oh my goodness, I feel like I've been on the fastest train ever and I've not grabbed any of it. So what my commitment is once today is over and everyone's cooled down and we've kind of let things settle if you'd like the content from my slides I can't let you have the images but I can let I can kind of pull out the content and create a PDF and if you think that you would like that um because there's some things that you missed then I'd be very happy to get that to you so maybe Joff I can arrange that with you brilliant so now the technical stuff happens I'm going to share the screen and then I'm going to keep going for it and uh, you can see the slides 
that I'm using. Here we go. Brilliant. That should be working. Fantastic. So, so when the doors of the church reopen, a big question that I find myself asking and lots of youth workers I chat to and, and us at Youthscape very much are asking is when the doors of the church reopen, will young people be there? And one of the things that we've noticed through, particularly through these three months, and, and the organisation that I work for, we've been taking weekly polls and surveys of young people and youth workers to find out how youth ministry is faring in this time. What we found across the board is that youth workers are telling us they have lost contact with the fringe. So young people that we only meet through schools, through detached youth work, um, through pupil referral centres, um, those that are experiencing tech poverty, so they can't actually access us online, we've lost them. Um, we're also discovering, of course, the National Youth Agency is predicting that three million young people are going to emerge from lockdown with increased mental health, emotional health needs. So we're discovering that discipleship has been very hard in this time and evangelism and detached work has been non-existent. And it's also revealed to us how so much of the churches across denominations so much of the church's youth ministry is built on a facilitated evangelism model. The idea being, we will put on events for you young people to invite your friends to, and our commitment is we'll try not to be too weird. And we're realising that for 20 years we've been saying, we've got to raise young disciples to be the evangelists of their generation. And we hit lockdown and realised that we really have to be doing this this innovation we've had to be doing it all along. And of course, this summer, there would, would have been many Christian youth events and festivals and camps, so Survive and New Wine, all the different regional ones that groups would have run that are not running this summer. And the summer was a real key time for about 100,000 young people to go deeper in their faith and for a huge number to become Christians for the first time. So youth ministry, is in a very significant time right now. What we used to do, we can't do. And what we used to rely on to see young people come to Jesus is not there. So this is a really exciting time for church leaders like yourself to be part of the conversation because this isn't, this isn't just an issue for youth workers. This is for the whole church, isn't it? Which is why you're here. It's exciting, but it's also daunting and one of the things that's quite daunting about this time is that never before have we seen such key um, differences between generations in one church in one leadership and actually as we emerge from COVID what we're noticing is that different generations are dealing with this in different ways and the generation the church has struggled to reach in this time is younger people. So here we go, here's some thoughts for you. So we're gonna to start today, this first session, before you're allowed coffee, we're gonna do the work of, of doing a little bit of a diagnosis. Now, in a morning on Zoom, I can't say everything that needs to be said. And actually, I'm not an expert, I'm an adventurer. I've been 20 years adventuring in youth ministry. So some of this is built on evidence and the research from our center. Some of it is drawn from other sources and journals and documents. Some of it is just my kind of observation and learned experience and you might resonate with it. You might well have questions and think I've missed stuff out. So I'm excited to say we're gonna have big times for group work to get some of those things out. So we're gonna look at a diagnosis. Then after the break, um, we're gonna look at the sweet spot. So what can the church do? What are the unique opportunities at this time to reach emerging generations. So first up, the bad news really, the kind of diagnosis, second bit, the sweet spot. So uh, the diagnosis then, what I'd like to do in this session is look at two key areas and the impact they have on reaching young people. So first we're gonna look a little bit about multi-generations. It's the rich diversity of our churches that we are multi-generational, but unless we pay attention to it, we can be losing the emerging generations because we're not moving swift enough to respond to them. And the second thing, we're just gonna look a little bit at the impact of young people growing up in, in Cannabula, in the cradle period after digital revolution. We're talking about the birth of the internet then. So first up, multi-generations. So a generation definition is a group of people born around the same time, they're predicting over a 30 year period, but that is actually shrinking 
sociologists are saying that generations emerging from this time are going to be changing every five years. So at the beginning it's 30 years, going down to five years. So over 30 year periods and raised around the same place, people in this birth cohort exhibit similar characteristics, preferences and values over their lifetime. And it's worth saying, I think, that for all that we as the church, and when I say the church, I mean across denominations. I'm Church of England. Um, I know I'm speaking into the Baptist um, church denomination, but when I say the church, I mean sort of across all of us. The way that we talk about, we, we, we want to innovate, but actually the reality is that the vast majority of churches in the UK, we tend to skew older we tend to default to the older models. So we have leadership that tends to be older, over the age of 40, I'm over the age of 40, um, and we tend to skew past. So we tend to say, um, what happened in the past, what worked then, we'll do that again. And so what tends to happen is, church leadership tends to be in the hands of people who share a generational, they exhibit similar characteristics, preferences and values. They tend to be from the same generation. Generation. And that has an impact on how churches are led. And I thought just a little fun way to kind of unpack the different generations is to think about how the British Army <laughs> has gone about recruiting uh, soldiers from these different generations. So stay, stay with me. And if you see your generation names, you might want to give them a bit of a whoop, whoop, that's my generation. So first up, the silent generation. These are people born 1945 and before. Um, and they are traditionalists. They value workplaces that are conservative, that are hierarchical and have a clear chain of command, that top-down management. And so basically the British Army just said to them, we want you, you just have got to, you've got to sign up. So they appeal to their sense of duty. Then we have the baby boomer generation, those born 1946 to 1964. Um, and baby boomers value workplaces that have flat hierarchies, democratic cultures, good human values, equal opportunities, warm and friendly environments. And some of us on this Zoom will be in this cohort. Some of us were called into ministry by leaders in this cohort because leaders in this cohort often are incredibly good at being pastoral, caring, looking out for people. So the British Army said, boomer generation, we want you and your devotion to the common good. That really appealed to the boomer generation. And stick with me, we're rapidly moving quite fast. Then we have Gen X. There are some Gen Xers out there, I know. Uh, Gen X was born 1965 to 1976. Generation Xers value workplaces that are fun, positive, efficient, fast paced, highly creative, flexible, and continually providing feedback. That kind of external loop. How was that? How could we have done that differently? That doesn't feel like a threat. Um, and so the British Army, to get hold of Gen Xers, said, We want you and your self belief. We want you and your self-belief. And then we come down to Gen Z. And I don't know if you've seen this, it's really funny campaign that the French Army have done. So Gen Z, um, those born 1996 onwards, also called Generation Alpha. Uh, Gen Z, unsurprisingly, because of the times that we're in, are motivated by security. Uh, they may be more competitive, they want to be super independent, they can multitask, they're entrepreneurial, they are digital natives, but they value face-to-face -face communication and they want to be catered to. And so the British Army very cleverly, I mean, look at this campaign, me, 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 millennials, selfie addicts, it's really gone for the kind of the zeitgeist thought process of millennials, you do you. We want you to do you. You haven't got to change the world, because this is a generation that saw the last generation not change the world and, and slightly kill themselves trying to do it. Don't have to change the world. Just you do you, you be you. Okay, so that's very rapid <laughs> looking at the different generations. But sociologists talk about how the key differences boil down between the generations, boil down to these three areas communication skills, the ability to adapt to change 
and technical abilities. I mean, I, I am sort of bridging Gen, um, Gen Y and Gen Z, and I'm terrible at technology. So all of us in our own way will totally buck the trends. And there'll be some of you, you know, in your 60s who are absolute whizzes on things changing rapidly. So this is not to kind of label generations and be prescriptive about them, but to recognize the challenges around this. So regarding communication skills then, baby boomers, tend to be more reserved, they're cautious leaders. Gen Z favor command and control, we're gonna do this. Uh, Gen Y prefer collab collaboration, let's do this together. Let's get all the churches together, let's, let's, let's hang out together, let's do a youth service for the whole place. And Gen Z, they want personal communication. So think about change management then, baby boomers are cautious, Gen X and Gen Y see change as a new opportunity, but Gen Z, you haven't even got to mention that the change is about to happen. They completely expect change to happen. They're not floored by it. They're not thrown by it. Of course, individuals in these communities will be, but as a cohort, they expect things to change. And then regarding technical ability, baby boomers and Gen Z value instructor-led courses and self-learning tools. But millennials prefer collaboration and, and technology-centered options. Um, and they, and they, 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 I, somebody I heard on the um, conversation coming in said, let's do what the young people in our youth group do. They immediately change their names on their Zoom profiles. I have never had that independent thought to change a name on my Zoom thing to something funny. But the young people, last night I was doing a youth thing with some younger youth, and while I was doing the Zoom thing, they were all using the art function and creating things. I'd never said to them, do that. But they got on, they got a hold of technology, and whereas I'm seeing it as a way to communicate and connect, they were collaborating. They were creating. Their way of connecting with, with culture and digital stuff was just so different to my generation, and we're seeing these changes so massively now. So there's a brilliant quote from a guy um, called James Emery White. And if there's one book that I, that you guys get, that I want to recommend to you to get hold of, it's, it's called Meet Generation Z by a church pastor of a mega church in America called James Emery White. And he talks about how Generation Z, so we're going to start zoning in on this group now, Gen Z, sort of age 25 and below, will be the most influential religious force in the West and the heart of the missional challenge facing the Christian church. Gen Z will also soon be the largest generation in the workplace. So very rapidly, the way Gen Z functions as a generation is going to be the way the kind of everything is, is geared towards them. They're quick paced, they're fast moving, their sense of creating their sense of self is going to become the main focus for the way that community moving forward functions. So that was thinking a little bit about um, generations, but also we're also recognizing that this is a generation who are massively impacted by some huge beasts that they are growing up through. So number one, Brexit. When uh, the country voted to leave the UK, um, I was working in North London and uh, the reaction of young people, rightly or wrongly, and I'm not gonna get to political discussion now, but the reaction of the young people in North London who I spoke to was they absolutely felt the old generations were sailing them down the river. And that wasn't what was in the minds of older people as they voted on however people voted. But their feeling was anyone over the age of 18 who voted <laughs> was choosing to put their safety before that of younger people. Then COVID-19, so much talk about keeping people safe and yet we very rarely hear um, from government, from community leaders, how young people are doing and how young people are going to fare um, through this. And of course, Black Lives Matter um, is a brilliant example of how generations cope differently with responding to massive issues of social injustice. If you think about um, the baby boomers civil rights movement, you can name the leader, can't you? Martin Luther King Jr. When you think about the millennials, the Gen Z's, um, the Gen Y, sorry, uh, uh, response 
to civil injustice, to the murder of George Floyd, what we get is no named leader. There's no obvious leader of the Black Lives Matter movement. There's a hashtag. And the hashtag is so powerful that even though only about 100 people on this hashtag say they want the statue of Winston Churchill pulled down, the Prime Minister, in question time, talks about how he doesn't want Winston Churchill's statue pulled down. There's the, the, the power of a movement of Gen Y saying this matters is so, so significant. So young people are growing up in a world where this is their reality. And Jonathan Grant, in his book, Divine Sex, which is another excellent book, not particularly about um, uh, gener generations... Um, Sort of reaching young people so much as how um, culture is shaping young people's idea about their self and about their sexual self particularly but he says this christian leaders tend to use scripture as their exclusive resource for framing christian speaking and living and yet he says only through a thick kind of thick description of our present circumstances being attentive to both the world and the church, can we deeply understand the hope of the gospel in redefining and reforming the self within our complex times? And this is really what I want to spend most of the time talking about. But before I do that, just look at the backdrop of that slide, Brexit, COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter. In the background is a photo of a hurricane. It's a photo of Hurricane Mitch that landed um, on Honduras in the 1990s. It was one of the most powerful hurricanes in the, in the 20th century. And overnight, um, they predict that it kind of destroyed 80% of Honduras's communications and road net networks. So overnight, roads were destroyed, um, railway lines were destroyed, communication methods were completely destroyed. And they quickly realised, the government quickly realised that to come out of this massive hurricane, they couldn't just simply lay down roads where roads used to be. They couldn't just go back to how it was. They had to reimagine a whole new way to get Honduras back up on its feet. I mean, I'm going to show you later a really powerful image on that and what they did. But I think I use that image because I think... The, what we're going through currently with COVID-19 and what we've experienced with the digital revolution and with Brexit and with all that's happened is what we're seeing is like a culture bomb has gone off. And George Floyd's murder was another culture bomb that went off. Um, and we will process it in our own way. But for younger people growing up in this world, this stuff has the power to completely reshape everything that they know and so as people who care desperately about reaching this generation for Jesus we need to be leaders who are prepared to look at a shattered landscape and say rather than default to what used to work are we prepared to look for the new places to lay down the pipelines to reach these young people. New ways, I mean, Louise and our little group were saying, actually coming out of COVID-19, I think mental health is gonna be one of the big things that we as a church got to respond to. That's the kind of thinking that I'm talking about. You know, Jesus is unchanged. The gospel has happened, the good news has happened. We get to be speaking and preaching the good news. But Leslie Newbegin says that the gospel is forwarded every generation to a new address. So the question for us is, What's the new address in the fallout of all this stuff that we need to understand so we can forward the gospel to the new address? So that's where I'm coming from on this. So what I'd like to do now is before we break into our groups is uh, to unpack five key things in culture that are shaping young people's identity and sense of self. And it's so important that we understand this. I call it the misformation of the self. So understanding the nature of the modern self, how young people see themselves, how they understand their identity, how they deal with the world and their relationships, has enormous significance for spiritual leaders because it cuts to the heart of Christian identity and mission within our culture. Is Christian identity being formed by the church 
or is it being formed by culture at large? And I imagine you have a gut response to that. So the overwhelming psychological question that every teenager is asking, whether they live in Honduras or Hartlepool, whether they're from a Christian family or not, the psychological question they are asking the world is, who am I? Um, I've got this picture of a chair here. And you can imagine somebody's identity being built like we build a chair. So you've got there the four legs of the chair and uh, child psychologists will talk about the four psychological questions that babies up to prepubescent children need, need answered. So it's questions like, can I trust? Have I got what it takes? Am I any good at this stuff? So the unaware they're asking it, but these are the developmental questions that children need to have answered before they can move to the next stage. And of course, it can be answered positively. Yes, you can trust. There are primary carers in your life who, who care for you, who put your needs first, or they can be answered negatively. No, you can't trust. Your, your family are high on drugs the whole time, so you've had to be taken into care. And actually, the world around you is not safe and predictable. You can't trust. And so you have these four like building blocks of identity. And then the question that adolescents are asking is, who am I? Which is a massively daunting question at the best of times, isn't it? But it's particularly daunting if there have been situations in your life where you think, I can't trust people or myself. I don't think I've got what it takes. I don't fit in. And suddenly, who am I? I'm building my identity on this really rocky foundation. And what also happens if the culture around you says, actually, who you need to be is X, Y, and Z. You're a Christian. Oh, my goodness. That, that means that you're a homophobe and that you hate people and that you're really repressed. Do you see what I mean? So suddenly, the who am I question becomes really weaponized in a culture that has very strong identity politics happening. So let me talk you through some of these five key things, and this is what we're gonna be talking about. So what are some of the key things that are shaping Gen Z's identity? Number one, digital reality. As the first Wi-Fi enabled generation, these young people are the most self-directed generation. They have, in their hand, in their smartphone, contact to you know, um, connection with most of the world's living people and most of the world's information. They also have, you know, access to the most bizarre, perverse, destructive, dangerous stuff they could have, and, and some of the best stuff as well. Like they, they, they are the most self-directed. And actually, gone are the days where adults are the source of information. We need to see ourselves as the advocates of wisdom. It's a very different role. They don't need young adults to tell them the meaning of life. They Google it. <laughs> Number two, performance of the individual. So for young people growing up today, they know that they need to perform who they are along very tightly prescribed lines. So let's take the Black Lives Matter as an example. Um, a number of black young people who I know here in Preston and in London were asking huge questions about, I re this really matters to me, I'm passionate about this, but I'm, I don't know that I'm doing, I'm, I don't know I'm saying enough on social media. I don't, do I get a blackout screen on my Instagram? Like if I don't perform this, then am I a hater by being silent and not being, not performing along certain lines about gender or about sexuality? Um, if, I'm, if I'm not allying myself to everybody who feels that they have some reason to say I'm being victimized in society, are they then, are they then part of the, the hate? Does that make sense? So for young people today, that desire to be an individual has never been greater, but the fear and the repercussions of getting it wrong have never been more dangerous. For example, if a Christian teenager was to tweet or put on TikTok, penis is male, they probably would have their account taken down, they'd be called a hate preacher. 
simply for stating something they perceive as self-evident biology. And so young people are finding they need to be this independent, fully formed, clear sense of this is who I am. I'm loud, I'm proud, I'm this. But they also know that if they get it even slightly wrong, they'll be at best cancelled and, and at worst completely destroyed. Um, pornography, pornification of life. I talked about that a little bit, but uh, young people are living today in such close proximity to a world, a universe of pornographies. And we know that the consumption of this sexual content has the power to rewire the brain and completely recalibrate their ideas about self-worth, connection and intimacy. So gone are the days where a youth worker thinks, oh, now I need to do a session on sex with my youth group and I need to be the one to introduce them to it. No, no. What youth workers are having to think now is the young people in my youth group have already seen stuff. They might not have gone looking for it, but they've seen it. So my job now is to somehow be able, have to talk about stuff that, that we shouldn't be having to talk about to 11 year olds, but this is the reality of the world that they're living in. So what's our role when they might have seen the most gratuitous um, sexual um, display of this completely racist, completely sexist, um, and, and, and what's our role in that? So digital reality, performance of the individual, pornification of life. Uh, I told you it'd be heavy <laughs> before coffee, I warned you. Number four, the rise of the nuns. This is not the rise of the nuns, as N-U-N-S, although I'd love to see more of a rise of the nuns, they're amazing women. But this is about, um, in the under 18s, increasingly, religion is not just seen as irrelevant, it's seen as dangerous. And this is what Muslim young people and Christian young people have in common. When Christian young people are radical and passionate about their faith, when they're basically being Christian disciples, they are perceived as fundamental, as fundamentalists. When they say, actually, I think Jesus says this about this lifestyle issue, or I think that following Jesus means this, they're seen as fundamental. Um, and so what we see is, among under 25 year olds, we are not going to see nominalism. It doesn't benefit young people at all to be nominally Christian. There's no benefit socially to saying they're a Christian. So if a young person owns that they belong to Jesus, you have in front of you somebody who is prepared to be seen as radical and fundamental. And I think this is a bit of shift in our thinking that we've got to really get hold of. So we know at Preston Minster, that if somebody under the age of 30 comes along to a service, the only reason they're there is because they want to be there. There's no social benefit to them coming to our services. So they're there because they're asking big questions. So suddenly we have to match that with community and with challenge and real discipleship because they're not on a fence. They're, they're, they're in, they're like exploring this. And that's been interesting about the digital space, hasn't it? About people trying out church from afar. So one last point, and then we're gonna go into our groups because I realized that we, uh, yeah, good, we're right on time. So the last one, number five, is the new total tolerance. And, and I think we, we see this a lot in social media. Um, we see it at the moment happening with um, J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books, with her views around uh, biology and the trans debate. Um, and there's a new total tolerance that, that goes like this. Um, Your words and ideas, if they disagree with what I think or feel, so significantly affects my ability to function that even your presence damages me. And I need you to come and ally with me and speak against them because that's the kind of protection I need in order to function. And we did some research at Youthscape um, into trying to find out how young people are asking questions of faith when they live in a world that says, if you ask a question, you, you sound like you're disagreeing with somebody and you're questioning them. So we, we did a bit of research and we had, um, I think about 20 Christian youth workers conducting hour long conversations with unchurched young people. And we just kept saying to them, do you have any questions about life, about faith, about where you go when you die? And for the majority of the conversation, these young people said, no, 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 I'm fine, no, I'm fine. Whatever, you know, and, and it was interesting because you, you think so much youth evangelism is built on the, on the model of apologetics. 
Young people are asking questions, so let's answer them. But we found devastating in this research, young people were not asking questions. So we called the research, no questions asked. But interestingly, at the end of every interview, when the interview was switched off and the youth worker said to the young person, how did you find that? They said this, invariably they said this, that was amazing. Like no one's ever asked me that stuff. Like I don't have anybody to ask stuff to. So the, the, the youth worker was saying, but you didn't ask anything. But the young person was saying, but nobody ever asked me if I had questions. So it kind of, it, it's propelled a massive bit of research for us at YouthTape about, well, how do we, in this environment, how do we help call that curiosity out of young people and this is what I'm talking about about this thick description like you and I could think about young people in our community and think they're not asking any questions about faith well on the surface they're not because it's too dangerous but what if we understood that and we realized that and we responded differently and we we did stuff not that worked with teenagers 30 years ago but that works with teenagers now because all of this stuff that i've chucked at you which you're probably like ah, what was that all of this combines in such a way that means that at the moment there is a huge wedge between church and youth culture but that wedge is a lie because jesus is good news for every generation and we need to be leaders that like leslie newbegin says the gospel is simply being forwarded to a new address and on our watch that's when the new address is, is opening up and we could be leaders that keep going this way and skewing older and doing all we could say let's enter the ugly zone and, and sports people know about the ugly zone the bit that feels uncomfortable because actually our mission is to connect so i will now stop and you will be flung beautifully into groups and these will be your questions. Ah, let me just back that up with this image. So this is a photo from Honduras taken a couple of years after the uh, hurricane. Can you see there's a, you might have seen this picture before, it's well known. There, the bridge is not over the river. At one time, that bridge was over the river, but the hurricane came and the river changed course and that bridge is no longer relevant. And that's, I suppose that's the tantalizing image to have in our minds. Jesus is always relevant. The gospel is always relevant. And as those that carry the gospel within us, our, the question for us is how do we make sure we're, we're building bridges in the right places, not in the places that used to work, work but don't work anymore. So here we go. Here are your questions. Does any of this marry up to your experience? or the perspectives of young people you know and you might say no talk about that might say yes number two how have the needs of young people been understood and addressed during this time i called it covod i know it's covid covod <laughs> both politically and on a local church level what's your response to this and number three when it comes to reaching and discipling young people what ways has the church nationally become a bridge no longer over river but if you're feeling brave Maybe the church that you've been called to serve. How has the church that you're in become a bridge that's no longer over a river? So I don't know how brave you're feeling for that. So, great. Well, I'm just going to wrap up very briefly. Do you, do you feel overwhelmed? I mean, I, del I deliberately brought out some big things there, big themes. Do you feel overwhelmed? Well, if you feel overwhelmed, slightly annoyed at me, you've got too much in your plate anyway, you know, good, actually. You're feeling the exile. And I, I think at the time of the exile, when God's people were sent into the desert and they wandered around for 40 years to learn how to trust God, um, God took away their Jerusalem. And in taking away their Jerusalem, he gave them the whole world, didn't he? Because God is after a people from every tribe, every tongue, every generation. And I think a little bit of my heart for this first part of the morning was, if we feel like the stuff that maybe was working pre-lockdown just isn't going to. And if, if we have churches that are saying, great, let's get back to everything that was, and you're thinking, no, this is a time to try new things. I want to kind of fuel that and say, good, you're feeling the exile. And as God takes away maybe some of the things that we used to rely on, he's going to give us the whole world, which is always his dream for his church. So in this next section, um, after coffee, it's, good. it's called the sweet spot. We're thinking about what is it that as churches we are best placed to do in reaching this generation. I've got lots of 
good news and hope stories for you. Because I, I think actually reaching this generation is going to be one of the most exciting things that we as a church do because lots of the baggage of previous generations, lots of the stuff of having to unchurch people and convert them to Christianity, we're not going to need to do. It's going to be a very different mission field. So come back after coffee, stick around, um, and we're going to be looking at some beautiful things that we can do to engage this generation in following Jesus. Well, welcome back, everybody. In a moment, we'll be asking uh, Rachel again to uh, engage with us. And I, I don't know about you, but I really found the session so far really thought provoking. Um, uh, but without further ado, um, let's welcome Rachel back. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you. And thank you for the feedback in the, um, in the sidebar, the chat bar. Bri brilliant comments. So insightful. Um, you know, you, it's so clear you understand your context. We, Jason and I have been doing church planting for the whole of six months before <laughs> um, lockdown started. So six months and then, and then three months lockdown. And uh, so we know nothing about anything, um, which is why we talk about it. <laughs> People who know nothing talk about it. Um, but I think one of the things that we've become very quickly aware of is as a leader, understanding your context is so key, isn't it? Like becoming an expert on the needs of your community. And it's so obvious from looking, reading the feedback, like you guys have got the finger on the pulse. It's just, it's really encouraging. Let me, uh, let me share the screen again. Get this going. Brilliant. Share. Um, here we go. Right, so the sweet spot then. So we, we've heard it said a lot, haven't we? The crisis like the pandemic, like COVID-19, is not just a disruptor, it's an accelerator. And I wonder what it's accelerating for you in your own discipleship, in your leadership. And, and maybe the, one of the reasons that you're on this Zoom today is mainly because you love each other. And that's so obvious watching you guys rock up on Zoom and welcome each other. But because actually maybe what's being accelerated for you is thinking around reaching the under 40s um, and particularly sort of the under 25s. Uh, so we've all been through um, a, a season of great adaption, haven't we? The fact that you're here on Zoom proves that you're a leader that can adapt, actually, quite frankly. <laughs> um, and, and a nice definition of being able to adapt is we hadn't planned to do it at all, or we hadn't planned to do it yet, but we've done it. So many of you have moved things online, um, something you may have planned to do at some point, but actually now you've done it, we've adapted. Um, but innovation is different. Innovation often comes out of being able to adapt, but, it's, but it is different. So innovation is we don't need to do it, but we will. And, and innovation is harder because whereas when we adapt, we do it out of a sense of great emergency and it's do or die, innovation is, is more the ugly zone that I talked about earlier. It's, it's the thing that feels like a luxury. It's the, you know, the, 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 uh, your equivalent of PCC in the Baptist Union, which I think is, the, is whole church membership, isn't it, agreeing? Um, probably it wasn't difficult to get everyone to agree to do something online to stay connected. But in this next season of leading, it's going to be very difficult to get consensus around things that you want to innovate coming out of lockdown. Because actually what people want, probably particularly if we're, we're working with those in the old generations. Remember our graph about change is unsettling um, or they want full collaboration. So the expectation that things will change is not there. Um, they'll want things to go back to the comfort. And if you're saying, no, let's, there is no going back. <laughs> there is only moving forward safely and beautifully and well then that that will be challenging so um so really my my phrase for you uh, in this is uh, pivot how are you going to pivot pivot younger is my cry to you really and i talked about earlier how one of the natural flows of the church is to skew older i mean left to itself every church will just grow older it just will won't it so if actually we want coming out of lockdown to be a church that really engages the under 40s that will require energy pivoting turning the boat in the opposite direction and our lovely bishop here bishop jill duff she says things like when you feel the overwhelming sense from a community or a church saying no that'll never work here <laughs> she says everything in our spirits 
should rise up and say that's exactly why it's going to work here so it's not about us fighting congregations or fighting people but it's about saying often the things in the spirit that need to change are often faced with um <clears throat> real barriers from those who would want to get on board you know when mary uh is uh, carrying the son of god it's joseph that wants to quietly divorce her you know it's not her worst enemy it's the person closest to her and often that is what happens isn't it as we sense what god is saying and we begin to live that out often it's those closest to us who misunderstand the most so just i just want to kind of frame that really and recognize that the stuff i'm about to talk about is not easy it's not easy to do um, so, uh, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what it might mean to pivot younger and then I want to give us three key areas that we can uh, operate in to really engage emerging generations in, in evangelism and discipleship. So, so, so first of all, um, oh sorry, I haven't got these on the slide. Um, so pivoting younger, this means creating strategy and allocating significant resources to reach young people. Um, and I'm not going to be prescriptive of what that is, but it means allocating significant resources. So number one, the churches that do this, that pivot younger, they invest heavily in their youth, their young adults, their, their student ministry, not just in terms of staff, but it's about staff, but also in terms of theological innovation, that they don't sideline this part of the church to a bunch of professionals. And I think one of the challenges, and I'm going to be careful what I say now, because I am a trained youth worker um, but I'm so old as a youth worker that I did all my training at Brighton University and Hastings local authority in the days before you could do a Christian degree in um, in, a, in youth ministry so my degree is in theology and then I took up some other stuff as well but I think one of the dangers is that we've slightly professionalized youth ministry and then we've outsourced it and people that come into youth ministry are astonishing incredible leaders um, but sometimes we expect them to be mature disciple makers theological thinkers amazing on safeguarding and governance great at connecting with young people so we tend to employ very young and then wonder why there's a disconnect with some of these other things so i think investing heavily in youth ministry is actually your role as well as a leader to think theologically about connecting with younger generations and to think about all that kind of stuff number two churches that pivot younger are very good at making younger people visible um, putting younger people on platforms, uh, making younger people visible in every area of church life and the decision making structures and employing younger staff, which doesn't mean that you fire older staff or if you're over 40 like I am, that you think, oh, there's no room for me anymore. Not at all. But you recognise that actually you need to be demonstrating this is what we're doing and we're going to put younger people in more visible positions, not to set them up to fail and not to give them authority beyond the spiritual authority that God's given them or their skills, but to say, actually, we want young people to see young people when they walk into the church. We want them to see people that look like them in our church. Number three, churches that pivot younger um, acknowledge the context and the culture of young people in all their communication methods, their tone of things. So if you want to be reaching under 40s, I wonder what under 40s are connecting with. Are they married? Have they got kids? Are they at work? What's their workplace like? Are they at university? An illustration to unpack something. If all your illustrations are about your wife and your kids, that might be a brilliant communication method for some people, but you've probably missed out a whole load of people who are single, of any age actually, um, but particularly of younger people. Think about in your tone, in your communication, is this resonating uh, with uh, younger generations? Talking about Black Lives Matter, talking about COVID-19, talking about the latest thing on Netflix, not in a token gesture, but recognizing we want to make these communication bridges with people. Number four, churches that pivot younger, sometimes are more likely to engage in church planting and I'm part of the church planting network and I'm not sure how many of you have been involved with church planting I mean the church that you're leading was planted once wasn't it so we're all working in church planting context but sometimes actually what needs to happen is that churches congregations are planted with a real priority around a certain demographic this church is planted to specifically reach under 40s. We want people over 40 as part of the church. 
but you need to know that the mission that you're getting involved with is we want to be pivoting younger to reach younger generations and we want you as part of that we need your wisdom and your skills number five churches that pivot younger make the mission of reaching emerging generations more important than their methods and i think what I, what i mean by this is that the methods that we use is like building with scaffolding so maybe on one particular housing estate this particular method of messy church works maybe somewhere else the method of a uniformed youth organization works maybe somewhere else the method of instagram services at 6 p.m on insta live works but they are less important than the mission the mission is whatever we do is about reaching younger people we don't really care how we do it that can change regularly but the mission doesn't change and i think churches that do this well can can look on the outside like they're fairly um very fairly brutal but they, they will pass every decision along that very narrow track so if we're reaching under 40s should we have notice boards in church with bits of paper pinned to notice boards does that communicate with under 40s or when an under 40 year old walks into church and they just see a mess of papers stuck on notice boards and signs here and weird china and crockery and doilies and fl and plastic flowers does that communicate this is not your place so it's so it else very hard questions of everything that is done under through that lens uh, number six churches that pivot younger they get ready for quick pivots for regular experimentation the ability to respond quickly to a rapidly changing culture and at the moment the voices coming out of the states are talking about church leaders that can pivot will be those that will have churches to lead into the future and we can critique a lot that's coming out of the states at the moment um, it's a very different um context there but if you want to see some interesting research the barna b-a-r-n-a -A, barna research a guy called david kinnaman who's a good friend of mine and um, he does some really interesting church in the states about how church attendance has changed dramatically so i was chatting with him at the beginning of lockdown he was saying the first few weeks of lockdown in the states they saw church attendance online drop like it plummeted it was almost like the demographic of nominal Christians said, phew, we haven't got to be at church anymore. Here's our chance to pull out. And I said, here it's so different. Here it skyrocketed. The first three weeks, everybody who could get hold of an iPhone or a laptop, even if it was like a little rural church where there was like one person <laughs> doing communion, suddenly 25% of the population were accessing church online. So it's a very different context, but there's some interesting things that come out. But of course, I hear you say, my friends, reaching younger generations or reaching anybody for that matter is not just about style and structure, of course. It's also about kind of the communication and the connection and, and what it is that we seek to do. So here are three vital areas to pay attention to, particularly reaching sort of the group that I work with, which is the under 25. So that's really what I'm zoning in on. Um, number one, encounter, encounter. In our culture today for young people, personal experience is the gateway to truth. So I think it's no surprise that we are seeing a renewed interest in spiritual encounter. At the back of Preston Minster, when we arrived um, nine months ago, there was a bunch of up to about 45 young adults aged 17, 18, 19, um, all dressed very grunge. I mean, they had to be wearing loads of clothes. This is the Northwest and they were sat in a graveyard and they were there every day, just, you know, littering the graveyard and smoking their fun stuff and chucking bottles of coke up onto the guttering of the church, the back of the church. And I think that the city hated them being there. We're, we're right at the heart of the city. So we, we planted, at the press and minster, the congregation dwindled to a tiny congregation. They very graciously, um, it would have cost them a lot and hurt them a lot, but they very graciously agreed with the bishop to close down the minster. And they've gone to a different church that's accommodating their specific needs. And, and some of them have stuck with us, which we love. Um, but we are a church reaching under 40s. And so we saw this bunch of young adults and thought, we're not going to kick them off the graveyard. Like, we want to reach them. But they, they were not coming into church. They were not having it at all. And every time we, every day we walked up, they'd sort of smoke their cigarettes and look at us who's like slit eye, like their eyes like, oh, <laughs> what are you going to say to us today? 
And there was one particular day where they were chucking bottles of Coke up on the guttering. So I, I walked very purposely towards them and they slightly were like, uh oh. And I said, are you chucking bottles of Coke up into the, into the roof? They said, yeah. I said, give me that bottle. So they gave me the bottle. I turned around, <laughs> it was the most wonderful thing. And I threw the bottle of Coke up in the air and it landed upright in the gutter, which is what they were trying to do the whole time. And so suddenly I was like, that's what happened. I said, that's what happens when God's on your side. And then I walked off. And of course, that is not what happens when God's on your side, but it just felt like a really fun thing to say. So it began a, a relationship with them. And every day I'd hang out with them. I'd take them food. I'd allow them to come and use a toilet. Um, saying what would it take to get you guys into the church and and what was interesting was the the sole reason really that they said was that they were so convinced that they led such terrible lives and many of these young people have been kicked out of care kicked out of college that their rejection they've experienced is immense but their overwhelming reason for not coming into the church was they felt convinced that god was real and if somehow they entered his holy place he would zap them and kill them I mean, massive. These are atheist, many of them, secular, nihilist, a little bit into the occult, young people who, who had an overwhelming sense that they would not be allowed into a church because God would hate that. Anyway, the day before lockdown, we were given huge numbers of black plastic bags filled with chocolate lint bunnies. And, uh, and they arrived. And the only people to help me unpack the cars and the vans were these young people or at the back of the minster. So I said to them, I totally respect your views. I disagree with your views. God will not zap you. I've also got huge amounts of chocolate that's got to come into the church so that we can feed the hungry. Please really help me. And dutifully, I think they're all slightly high as well, which probably helped. But dutifully, they all picked up big bags of chocolate and came into the church. And it broke my heart, really, because the day before we had to close the building and say, you can't come back was the day that they all came into the building and suddenly these conversations about Jesus and God and spirituality just like they absolutely just exploded across the church. I got my husband down to come and get involved with some and it made me think, gosh, in creating a space for young people to encounter God is crucial. One of the most defining marks of young people in terms of their spiritual lives today is their spiritual illiteracy. We can't rely on them knowing anything about what we mean when we say pray. Have you seen Russell Brand's little film on YouTube saying lots more people are Googling pray. I'm going to teach you how to pray. Where have our national leaders got on YouTube and created an amazing film saying, we know you want to connect with God. Let me teach you how to do it. Russell Brand's doing it. I don't know who he's teaching them to pray to, but Russell Brand's doing it. Like we've got to realize the space that we're in. And this is one of the greatest challenges for us in lockdown, I think, particularly as church leaders and youth workers. You can do the preachers via Zoom quite nicely. You can do discussions over Facebook Live. But how is the worshiping, the corporate worship been going? It's tough, isn't it? It's tough. We've really missed that encounter together. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories of what I've discovered um, and what we've discovered at Youthscape. So interestingly, young people are missing encountering God together in worship, but they are having powerful encounters with God in their bedrooms at the moment, waiting on God. And the practice of contemplative prayer seems to be going slightly through the roof. I was leading our older youth at the Minster um, on a Zoom a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I said, we're now going to um, mute ourselves uh, and we're going to wait on God. And we're not going to come back on until we think God said something to us. So we waited and we waited and we waited. And then somebody unmuted themselves and shared something and somebody else unmuted themselves. And these are young people who are still on a journey of their faith. But in their bedrooms, they heard God speak to them and they shared stuff that was so incredibly profound and significant because they're hungry to connect with God. And we have young people contacting us saying, I don't know. I think I prayed to God for the first time. Are you guys Christians? Can you teach me more about Jesus? It's absolutely incredible. So we need to adopt a come and listen evangelism that says rather than come and we'll teach you the doctrines and teach you the stuff come come and experience come and listen come and encounter come and meet god i remember years ago running a a, a youth group uh for the local authority that their youth workers that for the local authority um were 
it stopped working. They had this youth group of all girls. They wanted it to carry on. They asked me at the local church, would I run it? I said, yes, but I'm a Christian and I love Jesus. So I'd love to run this youth group, but I'll be in the church and um, we'll always give space for God to do stuff. And they, they were like, yeah, that's fine. The girls are fine with that. So every week we met, me and the other youth workers and these girls, not Christians, we would talk about everything, puberty, sexuality, relationships, identity, just do general sessions. We didn't really talk about Jesus a great deal. Then one evening, um, our worship band were in the next door room practicing and they'd put the lights down low and have some candles and just cushions on the floor. And the girls were saying, oh, can we go and listen? I was like, no, I need to finish this amazing session on puberty. <laughs> and then realised what I just said. I was like, yeah, no, go, go and listen to this. So they all snuck through next door. And I said to the worship leader, just keep practising, keep doing it. And these girls just lay down all across the church in silence. And they just listened. And at the end, I noticed that most of them had been crying. They had no idea what it was. But they encountered God. We need to create space for young people to encounter God. One of the most extraordinary things about Soul Survivor that's now finished, if ever you went to Soul Survivor festivals, there could be up to about 10,000 teenagers in, an, in a big top. Huge numbers. Think of all the pheromones flying, the hormones flying. And they could get crazy. Like it could be just off the scale outrageous. But at the end of someone preaching, often it'd be Mike or Andy or Ali would stand up and say, we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come now. And we don't whip God up, he comes down. And they would always hold a period of silence. 10,000 teenagers in silence, encountering God. Extraordinary. So let's create spaces for young people to encounter God, to meet God. Uh, Oh, there, oh, there's my slide from earlier. I'm so sorry. I put it in the wrong place. There we go. There we go. Never mind. Number two. So three thoughts for you. Number, the first one is cancer. Number two is choice. The art of practice. In our culture, personal experience, as I said, is the gateway to truth. So it's no surprise we're seeing a resurgence in spiritual experience and also in spiritual practices because this generation has to choose to believe in the way that previous generations were not so aware of. So for a young person, as I said earlier, to, to choose to be Christian, there is no supporting culture now that is developing their faith. They're not part of a society that says, oh, you're a Christian, that's great. They're not part of a peer group that says, oh, you sing in the choir, that's great. They're often not part of families that say, oh, you're a Christian, that's great. And so choosing to follow Jesus, for many of them, feels very early on a very um, personal choice that feels quite fragile. So being able to engage in the practices of Christian faith, I would say, is a prerequisite for this generation choosing Jesus. Taking on, trying on the practices of the way of Jesus is often the doorway to them exploring the person of Jesus. And, and years ago, when I was involved with the very first Romance Academy, our, the challenge that we were given was by the BBC, could you take 12 North London teenagers that are very sex obsessed, can you get them not to have sex and we will film it? So, we, so me and Dan are Christians. We created a programme that looked a little bit like Alcoholics Anonymous type thing. And we just said to 12 North London teenagers, we want to, to mentor you for five months to see if it's possible for teenagers to resist the pressure and culture to be sexually active early. So we weren't even saying don't have sex till marriage. We were just saying for five months, we want to coach you to help you resist the overwhelming pressure of culture to be sexually active because of all the negative implications of early sexual activity. So interestingly we never once opened our bibles the teenagers knew we were christians we never gave them an apologetic for a biblical sexual ethic but three of them at the end of the course out of 12 became christians just by asking can we follow jesus we didn't even say do you want to follow jesus three of them became christians because by experiencing a, a christian practice 
and receiving the benefits of that, like the feelings of worth and self-confidence and self-respect, that beautiful feeling that you can resist culture and it, and it feels great, like that introducing to want to know more about Jesus. So I'm a big fan of youth ministry that's about experiencing Christian practice. So, so we at Youthscape have done a huge bit of research called We Do God, and you can have a look at it, go on the Youthscape website. And I'm going to quickly talk you through the key findings of a bit of research we've done with youth workers and with young people in the church and outside the church about the benefits of this approach about practice. So number one, threshold experiences that help young people form habits of faith and to, 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 be, to deconvert them from a kind of a dead church kind of identity is crucial to them choosing a radical faithful Christianity so inviting young people not saying first are you a Christian then you can pray saying let's sit together and uh, at the skate park should we pray should we talk to God and inviting people to get into the practice even before the belief these are threshold experiences that introduce young people to Jesus What's great about these kind of practices is it opens young people to the rich diversity in the body of Christ. So I was working um, in North London with a bunch of teenagers who were all part of just street gangs. Some of them were involved in criminal activity, not all, but they were all part of gangs. Um, mostly I didn't share skin colour or ethnicity with them. I didn't share background with them. There was lots about us that was very different in our upbringing. But these amazing young people were coming to faith in Jesus from the most awful backgrounds. And we realized very quickly that we wanted to introduce them to just how beautiful God's church is. So we would, we would um, rock up with minibuses, stick them in the back of the minibus and take them to visit different churches in the area. We took them to high churches. We took them to low churches. We took them to festivals, all sorts of places to give them a sense of, do you know what, following Jesus doesn't mean you do this in one way doesn't mean you sing in one way sometimes you sing like this sometimes you sing like that and we watch these amazing teenagers who have dangerous lives on the streets who people have written off we saw some of them come alive in really quiet contemplative services and we saw others of them come alive in really pentecostal services so the, the whole thing was come and explore what it looks like to be a jesus follower Number three, the beautiful thing about prioritizing Christian practice is that it's a commitment for us as adults to do that job of co-discipleship, that we journey alongside them, that we model the practices we want them to mimic. And so it's not just about us teaching the practices, but it's about young people seeing the difference that prayer makes in our lives. I'll never forget one amazing session that I led with young people where I've been trying to say to them for weeks that, um, you know, talking to Jesus about everything and, and asking the Holy Spirit to give you self control does make a difference. And, you know, it's possible in any situation where you feel tempted and overwhelmed, it's possible to choose a Jesus way. And they weren't getting it until I invited this 39 year old businessman from our church who spends most of his time on the road in really exotic hotels. And I said to him, can you just chat to these young people about your practice, your Christian practice? When you go away to these amazing hotels, you're away from your wife and kids, what are your spiritual practices? And he said this, my first spiritual practice is I ask, I switch off Wi-Fi and I ask for the television to be removed from the hotel room. And the youth are like, why man, why? And he's like, because I don't want to be watching any porn. I love my wife and I honor her and I know my weakness. I don't, and they, suddenly it clicked for these young people like, oh, this stuff, like it makes a difference. It's just so amazing, amazing. Number four about practices. Also, it's recognizing that for young people, before they de develop and adopt individual devotional practices, they develop corporate practices. So although we do talk to young people about praying on their own, reading the Bible on their own, all the rest of it, actually what they respond best to is corporate. We're all gonna read through the Bible in a year. We're all gonna do this. We're all gonna give our money. We're all gonna go and feed the homeless. It's a corporate, it's the tribe responding. And I think 
this leads to my last point in this section and I'll wrap, wrap to the next one. But I think one of the most important things that we can do for this generation is create plausibility shelters. If you are 15 and you're at school and you don't know anybody that is a Christian, you need in your life plausibility shelters, places and spaces and people that help you try out what it means to be a Christian. What does it feel like to live for Jesus, to get things right and to get things wrong, to realize that actually as a Christian, we often learn through our mistakes. So youth ministry is not about teaching the doctrine, but it's about creating these plausibility shelters. What would you do in this scenario? What did I do in this scenario? How might Jesus want to live? What would it mean to live for Jesus today? So one of my big questions that I ask young people that I minister to here regularly, I ask them today, what will it mean for you to live for Jesus today? And what can I be praying for you? So today, how are you gonna choose Jesus today? How, not, not like three months ago, I prayed that prayer that you became a Christian and we'll just rely on that. No, no, that, that's happened, you are a Christian, but I'm really interested today to know how I can help you to choose Jesus today. And that means that as leaders, no topic is off, off, off uh, agenda, is it? No topics taboo. Nothing, nothing is too difficult or dangerous for us to talk about because you want to help young people choose Jesus. And the, and the last one, I realise I'm rapidly running out of time, so I'll be super quick. The last one is challenge. So it's about encounter, opportunities for encountering God. The second is about choice. How do we help young people choose Jesus and the way of Jesus? And the third one is challenge, the call to surrendered discipleship. When I talk with young people about sex, and sexuality. I'm writing a book at the moment um, for youth leaders and parents about this. And I think at the heart of this is if it is surrender, surrendered sex, surrendered sexuality. I think this is an amazing opportunity for us in church to recapture the heart of discipleship because I think we've been having conversations for too long or expecting youth workers to be having conversations for too long that almost are kind of outside of that central call. You know, I don't expect a young person that's not chosen to follow Jesus to live up to a biblical sexual ethic. But I mean, I'm really eager for every young person to know that their bodies are made in a beautiful way and that there are things that they can do with their bodies that will hurt them and hurt others and things that they can do with their bodies that doesn't hurt them and doesn't hurt others. But what I want to be saying to young people who are choosing to follow Jesus is the way of surrender is the most dynamic way to live. That rather than the more you know about Christianity, the more oppressed this feels. No, the more you know about following Jesus and how surrendered he calls you to be, the more free you are. And that's what we need to recapture. Tony Campolo says this, we won't lose this generation to Christ because we made discipleship too difficult, but because we made it too easy. I remember a few years ago, I was preaching at a youth event um, and I, uh, the call at the end, I, I really wanted to call young people to a deep, yeah, a real deep surrender, a radical surrender to choose, to choose sexual purity and sexual um, fidelity, to not be sexually active um, as a single person, to say, actually, I don't know what my future relationships will be, but, but right at this moment, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be sexually active with anybody. And I, and I said to the leaders, I don't want them to come forward tonight. I want them to wake up super early tomorrow at 5 a.m. and meet me on the beach. Because actually the, the kind of the will to do this, I, I want it to feel like this is not just an emotional response at the end of a service. I, it, this is a cold light of day discussion. We, but they didn't let me do that because the safeguarding was just a bit too tricky. But I think we can call this amazing generation to surrender to Jesus, knowing that their greatest driver is security. So recognizing, recognizing their deep desire for security, but also saying to them, you will never be as safe as you are when you are fully surrendered to God. There is obviously physical safety, emotional safety, and we need to create that space in our church. You know, safeguarding is not instead of the gospel, it is the gospel. But I think inviting young people to see that actually the life they were called to live, that is safe now and in the life to come, is the one that is completely surrendered. You'll never more yourself than when you're living a life fully surrendered to Christ and inspired by the Spirit. 
I'm going to end with this story and then we'll do discussions. Years ago, at the back of the Romance Academy, um, these wonderful 12 young people who are not Christians, not from a church background, we took them to um, America as part of the program and uh, to visit a sexual abstinence program. So it's very different to what we were doing, um, but they were Christians, we were Christians. And uh, our lovely young people on the Romance Academy, 12 boys, uh, six boys, six girls, got to stay with Christian families in Florida. And for many of them, it was the first time they'd really met a community of Christians. They'd, they'd known me and Dan from doing this once a week course sort of thing, but they'd never really met Christians really. And, uh, and they stayed, so we put them in pairs <laughs> in these lovely Florida Christian family homes, these, these characters that were larger than life. I mean, it was just <laughs> hilarious. And the love that these, these Florida Christians showered on these North London, unchurched, quite, quite challenging young people was extraordinary. Um, and on the plane on the way back, one of the, the teenage girls who was 16 had been in and out of care all her life. She sat next to me on the plane and, and, uh, and, and she had been with a super conservative Christian family that, you know, they, they laid it on the line about drinking and smoking and all the rest of it. And I was a bit like, oh no. And I, um, anyway, on the plane on the way back, this teenage girl said to me, did, did they love me? Um, and were they nice to me because they're Christians? And I said, well, people can be loving and wonderful who aren't Christians, but yeah, they, they do. They do love Jesus. And that, that's, that changes how they love people. And she said, well, are there Christians like that in North London? And I was thinking, well, I'm, uh, yeah, me for a start. <laughs> and I said, yes, there are, there are lots of Christians like that in North London. And she said, great, I'm, I'm going to go and find some. I'm going to go to my local church. And she, she told me, she explained where it was. And I suddenly remembered that her local church, where she was living in her hostel, her local church was a little um, brethren chapel that um, there was never any sign of life really midweek. And I think on a Sunday morning, they have about five people and, and nobody was under the age of 200, like that, that sort of church. And I was like, oh no, this is disastrous. Like her one chance of meeting God's people, it's gonna completely fail. So I said to my husband, we have got to kidnap her and take her to Soul Survivor in Watford, in like 20 minutes away. And my husband said, Rachel, you cannot body block teenagers meeting Christians. <laughs> You're not allowed to do it. Just let her go to the local church. Trust that God is bigger than your strategy. So I was like, Ooh. so I let, I was like, okay, all right. So all morning, Sunday morning, I was praying like, oh Lord, please, will, you, will she get on the wrong bus and end up in a really cool church? <laughs> um, and at lunchtime, I popped around to her hostel and I said, oh, how, how did you get on? Did you go to church? She said, oh yeah, I went. And she went to the Brethren Chapel. I said, how was it? She said, well, there was this woman on the front door. She wore a hat. Like, what was that all about? Um, and she gave me loads of books <laughs> for the service. Um, and then she sat with me and uh, she just sat with me for the service. Didn't really understand it. Um, they gave me some really nice drink afterwards. And yeah, it was all right. It was okay. And I was absolutely flabbergasted. I, I was expecting her to say, it was awful. They were all really old. It was the worst thing ever. And she just came back saying, yeah, it was fine. It was nice. They liked, I, I liked them. And, and it was, the, the jolt in my heart was that the amazing thing was that, that this particular young person had a certain tattoo showing that she belonged to a certain tribe group. And she wore her cravat in a certain way, her sort of neck scarf, which, and, and had, had it been a church with youth ministry ironically she might have gotten into a fight with other teenagers you, you don't know do you god sent her to the church where everyone was so old they just saw a living body <laughs> they saw somebody with a pulse and they just did what they knew jesus wanted them to do they just loved her and they cared for her and they gave her drinks and this old lady in her 80s just sat next to her for the whole service and i told that story about a year later we this lovely teenager didn't go back there we actually got her into a church where she could be discipled really well by a loving team of youth workers who were dedicated to her and, and that's what she needed but god knew that the first experience of his body needed to be a bunch of old people that would just love and and i get really choked showing that story and I, I i told that story a year later to a wi group in north london in that area and the lady on the front row began to cry and she was the woman on the door that welcomed this teenager and she remembered because they've, they've never seen the teenager before or since and I, I said to her afterwards god sent you one of the most broken and wounded and challenging young people that i've worked with because he just knew 
that you would help her encounter love and Jesus. So I don't say that to undo everything I've said, not at all, because actually this teenager couldn't stay there. They had to be somewhere where they could be nurtured and discipled. But I think sometimes the enemy would say to us, so the answer to all of this generational crisis stuff and all this culture crisis stuff is to somehow separate everybody off and put people into bubbles like we were hearing earlier. But God's answer to loneliness is not marriage, it's the body of Christ. And God's answer to reaching emerging generations is not professionalized youth ministry, but it's the body of Christ who have a specific heart, God's heart, to reach emerging generations. And I pray that as you just discussed now, that God will just enlighten your thinking and, and help you to see not the church that you wish you were leading. If, and if only I had X, Y, and Z, I could do this. But that he will enable to, you to see the treasures and, and, the, and the riches that you have in the community that you already lead. That in leading with his spirit, you could call out of them something more robust than they ever think they have to reach this generation. So here are some questions for you, my lovely friends. Some churches seem to have real appeal to the emerging generations. Why do we think this is? Don't get too cynical, but you could do if you want to. Number two, <laughs> emerging from lockdown, what one thing would you like to see the church stop doing? Plastic flowers. <laughs> what one thing would you like to see the church start? And then number three, how could your church pivot younger to reach and disciple emerging generations god has called you to this church at such a time as this he knows god knows who he has in you and what he has in you so enjoy discussing this in your group and then we'll come back and have a bit of a q a and you can send me all your best questions for the q a wonderful lots of questions there so thank you very much and uh, I'm pleased to see that I wasn't the only one I saw from the chat that cried during that story that Rachel shared at the end so <laughs> um so we've got some time for some Q&A we probably won't be able to get through all of the questions but we will kind of do our best um there was something Rachel that I sort of saw people commenting on and people sort of say that kind of youth attracts youth and um, so if you haven't got any to start with, where do you kind of start with that? And it might kind of link into something which somebody said about how do we do outreach with um, young people? Yeah, youth do attract youth, absolutely. Um, but we can make youth visible even if they're not in our building. So one of the first things we can do is regularly be praying for young people, have images up on our screens about young people, become really knowledgeable about the young people in our area. So even if they're not physically in the building, we can be a church that communicates that our culture is when young people come, they are welcome and we're here for them. There are three very basic model strategies for youth ministry build up, build in and build out. And most churches without realizing it tend to skew towards one of those. So if you have no young people at all, um, what you can adopt is a build in, build up method if you have children. So if you have some children in your church, you think, well, we haven't got any teenagers, but these children will become teenagers. So let's begin our youth ministry uh, in partnership with the children's work and let's start youth ministry aged nine or 10. Now I'm not saying you would do with them what you would do with 15 year olds, but you say we begin to train up volunteers now to be youth workers because youth ministry and children's ministry has synergy, but it is different. So build up and pour all your energies there. Build in is perfect if you don't really have any young people, but you have a bus stop near your church where young people gather, or you have a school, or you have a sports club, and you think, where are young people? And could we be doing work reaching them and building them into the life of the church? So it looks like detached youth ministry, it looks like a school's work team. And then build out is, we have a few young people in our church. Remember, three or four teenagers sat dotted around the church don't automatically see themselves as a tribe. 
you need to help them get to know each other. They don't automatically connect just because they're the same age group. But building with them, so it's getting them into a set of like, this is your group. We're going to respond to the three of you as if you were 30 of you. We're going to have lunches for you, take you on weekends away, do lots of activities. And the build out is we want you to invite your friends. So you have the courage to go out and invite your friends. So I would say to you, if, if you're thinking we don't really have many young people, ask yourselves, what of those three models build up, build in from outside or build out, which would be the best place to pour your energies? Very briefly, that's, I'm going to keep these really short. <laughs> no, that was brilliant. That's really great. Thank you. Um, so, totally other topic now, <laughs> but somebody else commented around um, the mental health um, concerns that we have around young people. And I think we've become much more aware of that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and have you got any kind of thoughts or reflections in terms of how the church might respond to that in terms of that? Should they become that a safe space in which you can talk about mental health and that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and interestingly, the government's talking more about social prescribers. So if someone goes to the doctor, they, they, they could get a medical prescription. But increasingly, um, these sort of primary care trusts are recognising that lots of young people and lots of adults are coming and what they need is social prescribing. They need to be referred somewhere where what they get is a listening therapy or a support group. So it's, it's things that if they don't happen, it might be that this individual will need medical intervention and clinical support. But right Right now what they need is community contact safe adults so I think um, we are not I am not a, an expert in young people's mental health but as a youth worker I'm trained and resourced around knowing how to signpost young people to further services also recognizing that the threshold at which young people need to reach to actually access clinical support is very high so actually we as church there's an increasing number of young people who need some mental health emotional well-being emotional resilience resilient support that we can provide. Now, I think when we think about mental health, we tend, I sometimes my mind jumps to diagnosable mental health conditions. What actually I'm talking about when I talk about mental health is um, resilience building. Um, helping young people understand emotional well-being. One of the problems is for young people is that growing up in a world where they know about mental health more now, what they can do is they can feel anxious and think, oh, I've got an anxiety disorder. Um, I'm somebody that still, I, I get panic attacks, actually. If, I, if I'm very anxious, I can, I can feel myself going there. And I think I, I sometimes go, oh my goodness, I'm going to have a panic attack. My, you know, and, and I'm 44 years old and I struggle with overwhelming emotions and anxiety. So how much more for young people who are facing anxiety? So I think we, we, what we could be doing is helping young people understand their emotions and understand tools to deal with their emotions and also understand what it means to bring your emotions to Jesus. Um, how, so I never pray for young people, God take away their anxiety. I will pray in the midst of their anxiety, help them to know that you are with them. So actually I think it's also, it's a theological thing, understanding the place of our emotions. Anxiety can be really helpful actually, but it's when it overwhelms us, and sends us into ruminating and like that's the problem so i think groups like mind and soul foundation can be very helpful in this um at youthscape we have a mental health and emotional well-being team who innovate resources for young people around this so i think look get get glean some stuff but i think we do need to be operating in this space but i would say not at the high levels i would say in this middle threshold group yeah now i just want to stay with that because i'm i'm really um I think the church has got so much to say about it and they think it's got to be high level so therefore yeah. don't do anything because they panic yeah. but I think we've got really important like you talk about contemplative prayer we've got yeah. such gifts that we could offer young people so I just really want to encourage people to sort of don't yeah. shy away from it you've got yeah. some beautiful gifts that you can offer the young people I'm um, in your community um, schools and everything so yeah so it's exciting well, it's not exciting, obviously, but it's exciting that we have a, we have a voice. <laughs> um, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so this is just a bit like a, a major question and answer, question and answer, but I just kind of want to get all your wisdom as much oh, well, as you can. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Well done, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, another question that somebody asked, and I kind of really noticed this, there's been some beautiful intergenerational involvement during lockdown with children and young people being involved um, in services where the pressure's off a little bit, they're not having to be up front and all that kind of thing. So there's a real 
some beautiful sort of um, pictures of belonging. How can we encourage that rather than just go straight back to how things were when everyone's put into their different groups? Yeah, I mean, I... I know that everybody listening, you're so creative I, I, and I, I realise that there's no easy answers. I think actually you probably already know the answer for your context. What we're going to do at Preston Minster, I, I'm so glad about this, is because of social distancing, we're going to get rid of rows of chairs and we're going to do in all of our services, what Jason and I do on a Sunday night at seven, six o'clock, is we're gonna have sofas and bunches of chairs because we're not gonna sit people in rows where they're close together for social distancing. So actually, it's a real opportunity to change the look and the layout of your building, which will lend itself a lot more to these natural conversations. There's nothing more damaging to relationships than rows of chairs. Because you can't get to anybody. You sit in the same place. The moment you have sofas and bunches of chairs and good refreshments, like put a bit of decent money behind good croissants on a Sunday morning. Get a team early on a Sunday to cook bacon butties. Get some teenagers and some adults arriving at church earlier to cook bacon butties for everyone. So I think if, if, if actually a really good treasure in lockdown has been this getting people together then then ask them what would you like to carry on doing together um, and it, and i think catering and food is a brilliant way to do it i think people have missed each other haven't they so i think spending a bit of budget on meals i think is a brilliant idea um capturing stories of lockdown could you give a great ipad and camera to a few people in your church and say as lockdown eases, could you go around these homes and capture on film what's God been saying to you? And, and, and get, get your younger people doing that with some of your older people who are great at tech. You know, get, capture stories of lockdown that you're going to sort of share and create content. And so I think I, I would say you are very busy, but give yourself a morning where you just go and sit in a park bench somewhere else and just say, what would I love to do? What sorts of things would I love to do, see our church doing? And, and, and try some of them and, and get them going and, and telling stories, having young people interviewing adults as well. You know, give, give voice to young people in this space. It's a great opportunity. It's great. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, we always, sometimes people struggle, don't they, to do, how do you bring about change within church? And we've just been given this, this moment in time where actually we can maybe make changes more easily. Yeah. Um, Brilliant, thank you. Um, could you comment on that whole thing around like entertainment versus the actual engagement of young people? And we know that consumerism, we've kind of, the church has sometimes sold out to that a little bit. So that sort of tension? Yeah, like I mean, empty entertainment. We all know when we're doing it and it sucks and young people hate it. They, um, but equally, on the other side, young people are visual. They love things to be fast moving and fast paced. And one thing that I've discovered through lockdown is, our young people age 15 plus, they seem to really enjoy the discussions over Zoom. They, they, will, they will literally be able to sit still for longer. When you're 15, you can. But the 11 to 14 year olds, they just want to do stuff. And, and, and so our youth work with them is like kicking a football around and going to the beach. And, um, and that's not entertainment. That is responding to the fact that when they're 11 to 14, the way God's wired them is to be very physical and it's beautiful. So I think let's absolutely not play the entertainment game like it's got to be super cool for them to rock up that's a complete lie from the pit of hell but equally let's not say the opposite of entertainment is sit still big bible discussions the more serious it is the more real it is because actually young people sat around a bonfire having massive discussions and a big old giggle about faith can be massively faith forming. So I think it's more actually about the motivation of the leader than actually about the end product. The end product can be as shiny and as fantastic as you like, as long as the heart of it is these young people growing their faith. Um, and, 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 and as with all things, the best things for teenagers are the things that you never plan for, aren't they? They are having five kids in the car and the car breaks down. And then you spend three hours on the side of the motorway with young people. I mean, that, that, is the, that is the memorable moment. So I think it's about creating memorable moments with young people. Those are the moments where they change. So I would say, please don't resist things being professional and good just because you don't want to entertain them. You know, and I think somebody very bravely said on their question, they said, um, it's been hard to engage young people in the general services of the church. Um, 
I, I think ask big questions about that. Is it because they are zoomed out? They are, they, are, they are digitally burned out. They're having to do schooling online. They're having to chat to their friends online and suddenly adults telling them to jump back online and it's just too much for them. Or is it because actually their expectations of stuff online is a certain quality and if they're not seeing that, it just doesn't care. So I think, and I'm not saying that to be critical because I, you know, it was more just to ask the questions. Let, let's, let's ask them. That's interesting you didn't connect. Can I just ask why? So yeah, let's avoid entertainment, but let's not think that any kind of professionalism is automatically shallow. No, let's, yeah. That's right, thank you. And just to sort of say, we've just been writing some guidelines um, around with like children and young people and coming back to church and what that looks like when we can meet face to face, all that kind of stuff. And one of the things we can say is ask them what they're wanting. When you talk about consulting the whole church, include the voice of children and young people in that. So don't just be adult centric in your thinking, but keep on asking the young people. They've got some really, and young children, they've got valuable things that we be hearing so again it's an opportunity for us to kind of change our practice a little bit if you're not already doing it and yeah. bring the voice of the children and young people in so that's great. now this i've shorthanded this one i'm sorry whoever who uh, i think it was david that asked the question but how good a christian do we have to be they have to be before they can become a leader kind of thing in terms of their discipleship and that kind of <laughs> and things like that oh my goodness i mean I think Jesus' disciples were horrendous Christians, weren't they? <laughs> um, uh, I, think, I think it's, it's a very important question, but I don't think it's a static answer. So I, I think, again, this is a super short answer. So you guys are wise, you know, you know more than I do about this. You've been doing it for ages. Um, I think it's what direction they're moving in. If I have a young person that I think, at the moment, I'm not seeing much Christian maturity in your life, but I actually know that you're moving in the direction of Christian maturity, then I will match your, I'll, I'll give you leadership opportunities, serving opportunities first, actually. I will give you in a way that matches that because I want you to, I don't want you to think there's a certain point at which then you're given, you're allowed to, to be a leader. No, actually I want these along the way. But if I have a young person who is resisting to growing, even if, Actually, at the moment, they're praying out loud. They've been through Alpha. They've got Christian family. But actually, they're resisting growth. But at the moment, they take another static. They look like they're following Jesus. I'm, I'm going to give them less. I'm, you know. So I think, it, I think it's about the direction they're traveling in. Jason and I, on a Sunday night at 6 o'clock on Preston Minster Instagram, we are doing our 6 o'clock service for emerging adults. And we've started something called hashtag the 60 second sermon. And every Sunday night, we have a different one of our young adults aged 18 to 30s will prepare and give their 60 second sermon. I'm not sure that the last two, I would necessarily know if they are fully following Jesus. In fact, I've asked them that. I've said, I love you to do the 60 second sermon. I realize this is a journey for you. Would you be up for finding a Bible verse, asking God to speak to you and preaching on it? Both of them have said yes. And both of them said, yes, I'm not sure I'm a Christian yet, though. And I'm like, that's cool. Just, and, and I think because I've asked them to do it, I've then walked with them, prayed with them, asked God's Holy Spirit to reveal them, asked, asked them what they think God's saying to them. And it's really interesting because for both of them, that experience has drawn them close to Jesus. I'm not asking them to baptize somebody. I'm not asking them to preach a 40-minute 40 40 sermon. I'm asking them to do 60 seconds on what God has said to them through a Bible verse, knowing that God will speak to them. So I think it's, it's about matching, taking risks in discipling this generation, but never making them, they, they're about to fall. You know, this is, we, we've put them in the limelight and they're, they're now about, they're about to fall. That, that'd be horrendous. But I think let's take some risks. You know, what direction are they moving in? I also think that many young adults and young people don't become Christians because nobody asks them. And I think actually we could get bolder at saying, do you want to follow Jesus? I know last week you said no, but this week, do you want to follow Jesus? And, I, and when we first planted the Minster, Jason and I on a Sunday night at five to six would get outside the front of the Minster, stand on the high street where everyone's queuing up for the pubs and clubs. And we'd say to them, we've got a church service happening in there. Do you want to come and check it out? Come and get a donut. You can disappear again then. You, and they'd say to us, these young adults would say, oh, am I, am I allowed in your church? And we're like, yeah, of course you are. This is for you. 
And so we said to our congregation, when people walk in to have a look, don't turn and moan and frown and get all like, oh, why are they? We're here for them. We want them to come and give Jesus a go. Come and check it out. So I think we need to get bolder at inviting. Someone's put bolder street evangelism. Yes, I agree. Bolder inviting people to follow Jesus. Um, and if that helps, I, I think it's very contextual and it's about relationship. I know these young adults. I, I know who I can ask. But yeah. Well, a, a couple of thoughts pinged in my brain when you were saying that. So the place where you're in now, have you kind of built it up almost from scratch? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So because someone was saying about stories where they've, where kind of change has happened. So could you just tell us a little bit more about some of that journey? Would that be okay? Yeah. So we, we planted, there's about 34 of us that came together to plant this church. And there was about five um, or six people already from Preston who felt God call them out of the church they were in they chatted with their church leaders they had the blessing of their church leaders and they joined us and our focus is absolutely not on sheep stealing so any lovely christians from other churches that come and say oh we're thinking about coming to preston minster we very kindly say we love you go back and bless your church community um, and if your church leadership says actually they're with our blessing then great but we're here for people who don't go to church who don't think church is for them who would never darken the doors of church and because because we're right on the high street and we're very visible it's a nightclub end it's the bars it's the cafes we've got the university right there so we've just got really bold about the uh, go and tell so come and listen go and tell so all of our services are come and listen we have a donut wall outside our church with, with ring donuts hanging on them come and grab a donut come and check out what's going on and then we have a go and tell we go onto the university campus we get when we're invited to we go onto the streets and we tell people do you know that something incredible has happened that you can already be free, like God's already done what you need in his life, so come and find out about it. So that's, and, and, and we're seeing growth with emerging adults, but there are challenges with that because we don't know really anything about their lives. They'll come from a variety of backgrounds, um, but we are taking the risk that Jesus is big enough to cope with all the stuff that's going on. And that as we help young people love loving Jesus, and as a culture, as we mimic being surrendered in every areas of our lives, our money, our sex lives, our, you know, our finance, our, as we model that, that we're inviting young people, this is what it looks like to say yes to Jesus. So keep moving in this direction. We're walking with you. Somebody asked a question about, you know, what you want to see in young, a young person's sex life before you invite them to be a leader. I, I've, I would say I am, I am conservative in my theology around sexual ethics. I'm really pragmatic in my pastoral care. And I think what I mean by that is I, I hold a really strong line actually about what I think it means to follow Jesus in terms of my sexual behavior, <laughs> that, that Jesus puts demands on my sexuality that, you know, that, that's, I, I see that in scripture. But I also see that actually at the moments where I messed up the most, that's where I experienced the grace of Jesus the most. Um, and, I, and I crave that for young people. And I, so this is what I say. I expect the young people that I disciple to mess up sexually many times. I expect it. I, I don't want it for them. I don't want them to experience the hurt of that. But I expect that will happen. Um, and actually, I also have high expectation that as that happens, that I'll be in their corner fighting for them and they will know that Jesus is fighting for them and they will know that they can bring that to Jesus and know his grace and restoration and, and pick themselves up and move forward with humility and set new boundaries because of what they've been through. Sexual purity is not the same as sexual virginity and it's not the same as sexual innocence. And, and the trouble is that sometimes we say, the moment young people hit the age where they're interested in sex and sexuality and ask questions, that, that, that they're, they're losing it, that, that sexual purity is about like stopping and halting it. Well, no, actually sexual purity is about helping them know that the, the spirit makes them strong and free and they can set boundaries that are countercultural and they can live a different radical way. And when they mess up and when it all goes horribly wrong, Jesus picks them up and, and with humility they begin again. And maybe they do step down from that or from this or they're challenged on that, on the this, but they see the adults around them challenged by that too. The challenge, the adults aren't fixed and youth, young people are not fixed. We're all, we're all messed up and need Jesus. I could talk forever about this because I share, I share the heart of the people listening to this. Yeah. But I think we need to be pragmatic in our discipleship, yeah. 
yeah no that's great um I, I, i've heard you speak on it before and it's, it's i just love that uh, a more conservative voice which has a a, a much more i suppose uh yeah you said a pragmatic. generous orthodoxy i think yeah. would be a phrase that i would use yeah yeah no, that's great it's wonderful um somebody commented about detached work and I've kind of know in our area and that actually young people aren't hanging out as much as they once were. I, I used to do detached work. And so they're just not on the street corners and in the parks and all that I kind know, of thing. Oh, it's so annoying, isn't it? <laughs> I know. I used to love the, the thing of approaching these unknown young people and how are they going to respond? And um, yeah, so that's kind of something that's um, on hold until maybe times change again. So obviously they're found online or they're found, and that's not the safest place for youth work always to be happening, obviously. And, um, and in schools. So could you, what would your reflections and comments be around then reaching out? And also we know to see that youth clubs, there's some which are really thriving, but they're generally on the decline. Yes, they are. I mean, gathered youth work is absolutely on the decline. I think it won't be long for the only people to be doing gathered youth work to be sort of uniformed youth organisations like the Scouts, which is so popular, it's unbelievable, um, and, and faith-based, church-based stuff. So I think there will always be a place for gathering young people, but I do think working in partnership with schools, pupil referral units, further education, um, and then who el whoever else in our community is reaching young people is so important one of the big phrases that's come out of covid19 is we used to talk about young people being at risk we now talk about the wave of people who are off radar and at risk and it's a new phrase that's come out and it means we know that domestic violence has increased during the pandemic so we know that more teenagers and children will be witnessing domestic violence so we know that they are at risk because of that we just don't know who they are they're off our radars. So I, I do think that young people will get back onto the streets as families allow them and as they just boredom sets in and they just, you know. So I think, I, I personally feel we will see a resurgence of young people out and about. Um, somebody very rightly put in the feed on the chat, um, you know, young people are going to be blamed for any spikes in in uh, COVID-19 out and about. And, I, and I'm seeing that in Preston, that young people are being demonized for just being out and about doing what young people do. They're not even smoking and drinking, they're just walking around, how dare they? So I, th I think there will be a need for the church to get a detached a theology and a practice of detached youth ministry again. I absolutely think that will be important. Um, but how, I don't know yet. There was something around the pivoting and, and that whole kind of, because actually it's so easy for people just to ping back to what's familiar isn't it yeah. so how can we encourage that kind of innovation and that kind of the risk taking um because sometimes when people become a little bit too uncomfortable they they kind of look elsewhere don't they so it's that kind of tension between the two yeah, yeah. and somebody put on it you know i have got a mountain of pivots ahead of me don't add another one and, and i would say i mean i would cheekily say this is not about adding it's about saying just just define what your pivot's gonna be you know what what i i think actually pivots in younger probably is the only pivot we can do which doesn't mean that we say older people don't matter it's absolutely not the same as saying that in any way shape or form um old people matter massively and as you know as a society we're waking up as well to how as a society we how badly we treat older people so in no way should the church come out of this saying well old people don't matter it's just about the young but I think it's about recognising that actually as churches, we tend to cater naturally towards older. So if we want to be extending our reach, we've got to pour energy that way. I do think that planting congregations can be a good way of doing this. Again, which isn't about separating, but it's about saying we recognise that meeting the needs of these different communities within our community is a challenge. So maybe coming out of this, we could look to resource within our area or just within our church a new congregation a new expression of, of church in a different way that could be a great way that that comes out of this and we meet together for meals and we connect as much as we can but we're gonna we're gonna try we're gonna innovate and i think that is a word for this age like spiritual innovation prophetic imagination give things a go try them out and you will be amazed at the people that are energized by that. So Gordon Beckett, I've named him, Professor Emer Emeritus at UCAN University. He is in his 60s, at Gordon, I don't know if you're listening to this. Um, he's one of the best youth workers I know. He's one of the best youth workers we have at the Minster. He, he's at the front of the line when everyone wants to do stuff with young people. He's like, I'm there, 
I'm there. So I think, you know, as you do this, you will be amazed who comes out of you at the woodwork and wants to serve um, as, you, as you pivot. <laughs> We're going to be sick of that word soon, aren't we? It's like netball, pivot, pivot. Oh. And, uh, um, no, it's, it's really good and you, it's, it's just sometimes it's the small degrees isn't it that you do each each time so that's that's really important um there's something around sharing faith like encouraging the peer sh of sharing faith and um i went to this there's some research that was done with the under fives actually and they sort of talked about um the confidence of sharing faith but actually what they were saying was there's a confidence in people of inviting them to events so i don't necessarily think people are as confident about sharing faith as they are about inviting them to something so somebody else shares the faith, kind of abdicate yes, the responsibility. Yeah. Um, what would your reflection around young people and sharing faith with peers be? Well, I think, I mean, again, it depends what we mean by sharing faith. If, if, um, if we think that sharing faith is a kind of a, a set few things that we say, then, then that will always feel quite clunky. If, if we say sharing faith is, actually I have the risen Christ living and active by his spirit alive in my life. So anytime I engage on social media with my friends, I'm sharing Jesus because Jesus is at work in my life. So my attitude to money and plastics and Black Lives Matter and justice issues and being vegan and, and my, my, you know, how I treat my body, that's because of Jesus. So I think if we sort of say to young people, it's a whole life discipleship, living your life for Jesus in front of your friends, living in such a way that makes them provoke to ask questions. I mean, that doesn't scripture say that, live in such a way that, that um, you know, your father will be glorified and, and it's tantalizing about your life. So I think we do to help young people capture a bigger vision of what it means to share their faith. Um, we ran a, a course at Youthscape and, um, about sharing faith online and we got Christian young adults to come and join us. And what really amazed me that, that they had a week creating these films and creating content and not one of them, and we said it's about sharing your faith online, not one of them talked about Jesus in their films, not one of them. And at the end, I sat down and said to them, you guys, this was about sharing your faith in Jesus. Not one of you have talked about Jesus. Can, you, can we just unpack that? And it was really interesting because they said, well, I didn't know how to, to talk about Jesus. And then I said to one girl, well, you're, you made your film about fashion and about the fashion industry and how you feel it's so unjust that people are made to feel bad about not looking a certain way. Like, where does that injustice come from? And she said, well, it comes from the fact that I believe that, that I'm made in God's image and that Jesus loves me as I am. And I said, share that, share that. So I think it's about helping young people connect. The, you know, what difference does loving Jesus make in your life? How do you see things differently to your peers? Connect the dots. So talk about that. Talk about the fact that you hate Zoom because you have to look at your face all the time. But by looking at your face all the time, it makes you say, Jesus, I don't like my face today, but I know you like me and I'm going to trust what you say about me. Like that's sharing your faith, isn't it? That's sharing your faith and sharing your face. So I think <laughs> it's about helping young people connect the dots. There's not a set thing to say to share your faith. There's showing the difference that Jesus makes. I think that, and they redid their films and they were just amazing. Oh, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Like, yeah, really kind of echo that, isn't it? We, we want to be so prescriptive sometimes in what it kind of means. And we like these easy kind of, but actually yeah. sharing our lives, isn't it? Um, we, we, I'm going to end it there because we've only got a minute left. And, um, and we really, really want to encourage people to, we're going to break out into groups and we're going to pray for one another in our context that we're in and for the young people that we know and maybe the young people that we would love to know but we don't know yet and we definitely want them to know Jesus. And so uh, we'll, we'll have some time of praying and then you'll be kind of pulled back into the um, main room. I think we've got about eight minutes for our prayer time and then pull back into the main room where we're going to kind of wrap things up so thank you so much Rachel for doing that oh, Q&A can I just can I say one last thing even in your own networks you have like some fantastic thinkers who, who have already been doing this stuff before lockdown so Stephen big up for Stephen Fennick and um and others and you Claire and others so you know God's given you amazing people here to, to journey with thank you so we've got through the whole event without actually having any particular um, issues so uh, we are grateful to those that uh, have facilitated 
Chris behind the scenes, Joth, massive amount of work. But Rachel, to you, we, we don't really know where to sort of land in terms of how we thank you because there's so many brilliant things that you offered to us. So uh, a, a wonderful morning, very, very important things that you've sowed in, uh, amongst us. So thank you for that. And uh, we are so grateful to you. Um, I'm left with something that you said at one point, which actually touched many of us, which is uh, in the end, it's about being the body of Christ. And uh, we embody Jesus together, but you have embodied Jesus to us as well in the way that you've been, as well as what you shared. So God bless you richly in your continuing ministry. And what you said to us, we say to you as well, somehow you need to be renewed after all that you've given out. So I'm going to pray for you and then we finish. So let's pray. Lord, would you bless and renew Rachel and her family? And we pray that you would continue to enable her what it means to know you and to be loved by you, but also to make you known and help others to make you known and make connections, particularly with those who are young and younger. Thank you for the calling you've placed on her life. Help her to know again how good it is to be loved by you. And we pray for ourselves that you would renew us too. Uh, not simply in our energies, but also our ability to know which parts of today you want us to take forward and with whom. In the name of Christ. Amen. Inspire, connect, resource, growing healthy churches, is in relationship for God's mission.